And I said, Joe, that's the exact opposite of what you told me, you know, at, at this particular time when we were training. He goes, what, you don't think I should evolve? Hello, everybody. It's episode 36 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. John Graydon. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also Whistlekick's founder. Here at Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear and some great apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of the returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out what we offer, like our exclusive sparring boots. We got rid of the annoying toe strap and made other improvements that make them the closest you can get to sparring barefoot. You can find more information about those and the rest of our great equipment at whistlekick.com. And all of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for our newsletter? We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests. And now for today's episode. On episode 36, we're joined by Mr. John Graydon, a very well-known martial artist. Mr. Graydon is known as an author, industry visionary, coach, instructor, and student under two legendary martial artists. Like all of our episodes, Mr. Graydon tells some great stories. But unlike most guests, Mr. Graydon does not pull punches. He offers strong opinions on martial arts and the way some things are done. Honestly, some of what he says may upset you. I enjoyed our discussion and found his points, even those that were a bit unsettling, to be made with respect and logic. You might have to listen to this one a few times. I certainly did. And with that... Mr. Graydon, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Mr. Graydon, you say, I thought that in my advanced notes I told you I must be referred to as Grand Poobah. <laughs> Don't you guys pay attention over there? Apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> you walked in hands down on that one. That was good. I did. I did. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's, we. I'm sure we could have a whole separate discussion about titles and and how they seem to be escalating and people keep finding new adjectives to throw into their rank. Oh, I have plenty of theories why that happens. <laughs> but before we get into any of that, why don't you start by telling us how you got to start in the martial arts and when and what you've done and, and all that great stuff. Give us some context. Well, I started training, you know, like a lot of guys during the Kung Fu boom in the mid 70s. My first expo exposure to martial arts was watching the Batman TV show. And there was a crossover guest of the Green Hornet and Cato, and I had no idea that Cato was being portrayed by the late great Bruce Lee. I guess he's not so late these days, but the great Bruce Lee. So that you know, the, the ending of the first episode was Robin fighting Cato and Batman fighting Green Hornet. And man, the, the narrator can Robin hold up against Karate Master Robin? Tune in next time, same bat channel, same bat time. I mean, I was. I was freaking out. I thought those cool as could be because the smallest guy on the screen was getting all the respect. And we just yeah. couldn't take your eyes off Bruce Lee. So years later, when we moved to Florida, uh, my dad took me to see the five fingers of death. And it was the first chop sake kung fu film that was widely released. And that was the beginning of the whole chop sake kung fu boom in the 70s. And we'd never seen anything like it. Dad raised us on John Wayne and Clint Eastwood and Charles Bronson. And, and there were rules about fighting. You don't you never hit a man when he's down. It's easier to kick him. You definitely never kick somebody in the groin. But all the rules went out the window watching these guys fly through the air and doing these outlandish fights. They not only kicked a guy when he was down, they stomped him into an instant grave. <laughs> yeah. They didn't just kick him in the groin. They ripped his guns out. So I'd never seen anything like it before. And the following Monday, as a you know 14-year-old kid who, who, when I get into something, I get into it. I was on the phone calling karate schools locally, and I made the rounds. You know, and it, you know, I had no idea what karate was like. It was just Bruce Lee and what I saw in the back of the comic books. And you know, all the comic books promise that the smaller guy can beat the larger opponent. Well, that really appeals to a 14-year-old, this chubby little 14-year-old, because that's what I wanted. I wanted those secret techniques, and I knew I wasn't going to go to China or Japan to learn them. So uh, I called around, and, you know, I get conversations like, for, for the people that answered, hi, Kyosho Kuki Karate, um, how much are your lessons? $25 a month. 
Okay. Um. Thank you. Click. Mm. Uh. Shang's Kung Fu. Hi. How much your lessons? Thirty dollars a month. What is Kung Fu? That's not like karate, is it? No. Kung Fu's better. Bye. <laughs> But, but one guy answered the phone and spent 20 minutes on the phone with me. He asked me why I called, what was the motivation, what interested me about karate. And I asked him questions about the Yellow Pages ad because in the ad it said that he was a kata champion. I said, what is a kata? I, or a kata, I think I call it a kata. So he explained to me what a kata is. And he said, said that he was the United States lightweight champion. I said, I don't understand. I thought the smallest guy could beat the biggest guy. Why would there be weight divisions in karate? I just envisioned that you know there'd be a, a pile of dead bodies and some Japanese guy standing on top of them with <laughs> you know bl bloody chopped hands or something like that. So he was really patient, and he asked me to get a pencil paper and write down information, and he invited me to come watch their advanced class at the new school that just opened in Largo, Florida. And the guy that talked to me was Walt Bone. It was amazing. It was a he, he really made a connection with me, and I you know I convinced my parents to let us go watch class. Mom stayed home. These were kind of guys things, and but it, it was it had to do with fighting and karate. So my dad was intrigued. So we went and watched the class, and you know we walk in. And I sat and I'm watching the class, and the 16 year old blue belt is kicking a pole in the center of the room, one of those support poles, but they wrap padding around it for safety, and the whole building was shaking every time he kicked it. I thought, oh, man, that is amazing. I have to have that. So that's when I started my training. My parents wouldn't pay for it. But I have to insert that. The cost was $25 a month, and there was a one-year contract, and my dad was not going to sign any contracts. So it was shelled for about four or five months. My brother and I were out uh, a while later shooting baskets, and the phone rings. I ran inside. It's Debbie Bone, the wife of the owner. Hi, this is Debbie Bone from the Florida Karate Academy. I'm just calling to see if you're still interested in training with us. I said, oh, I'd love to. I'm so, I, I really want to do this, but my parents won't pay for it. She said, well, you sound like you're really sincere. You'd probably be a good student. Tell you what, tomorrow when you get out of school, come on by and you can keep clean the karate school for your lessons. I was the original wax on, wax off kid. Yeah. And I was there, man, oh, man, next day. And I knew from my first white belt class that I was going to do this for the rest of my life. It was an immediate connection. That's fantastic. That's a great origin story. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we're big on stories here. So bring us, bring us a few years into the future. Well, I, oh, there's, there's some, some darkness there. Uh, I'm writing a book actually that tells these stories in depth and it's really pretty dang interesting. The school was run by Walt Bone. Walt was a, a, an acclaimed competitor. He was in the magazines. He was a national kata champion and fighter and all that kind of stuff. And he came out of the um, Junri, Alan Steen, Mike Anderson School of Tex Kwon Do, as we referred to it in that day. So it was a very good lineage. I, I had joined without knowing it, one of the best schools in the country. And it was run with a high emphasis on martial arts skill. There was not much in the way of life skills. In fact, the school, in many ways, you know, today that we advertise that the best thing that you can do for your kids' school grades is to enroll them into martial arts. Well, the worst thing you could have done for me, for my school grades, is to enroll me into martial arts <laughs> because I was a straight-A student. I was on the honor roll, but once I started training, nothing else mattered. I would open, you know, I'd be in biology class. I would open my biology book and I would slip in the latest issue of official karate magazine. And I'd be reading, you know, the instructor would be talking about cell fission and I'd be reading about self-defense instead. So my grades dropped. I started, I really went down a bad path. And in many ways, <coughs> it was following the example of the leadership at that particular school. So it was a unique situation and, and one that uh, I, I don't think a lot of people have had. But I eventually, after, I mean, let me put this into context. So moving forward, I was training like a beast. I was going to the school every day to clean the, the school, and then I would train. And the instructor at that school, a man named Hank Farah, F-A-R-R-A-H, he took me under his wing and made me his personal training partner from the time I was a green belt until the time I was a brown belt. So we would spar every day and do drills every day. And I got really good really fast. And it was um, – an interesting process. And then I eventually actually got thrown out of the school. 
I got kicked out of the school by Walt Bone for being a complete butthead. And martial arts, there's a lot of things about the martial arts that people subscribe to that have not been my experience. And things that I didn't learn until later that I wish I had known then. One of those was the importance of controlling pride and being humble, which is in many ways the way in karate do and traditional training. But this school was far from that. So I was reading in the magazines, and this stuff was a brown by the time. I refused to test for, for black belt. They wanted me to test for black belt. I was really good. I was sparring. The only black belt in the school that could beat me was Walt Bone. So I, I was really dominating at the time. And I refused to test for black belt because I didn't want to do kata. I thought, this is a freaking waste of time. And so what I would do is I would wait during brown belt, brown belt class until the students were sparring. I would wait outside, looking in the window, and I saw when they started to get their gear on, I would run inside. I wouldn't bow in. I would just put my gear on, I would spar, and then I wouldn't bow out. I'd get out and leave. It was completely disrespectful. I'm, I would throw myself out of the school if I was my own student. And that's what happened. But at the time, sorry to interject, but at the time you didn't realize you were being disrespectful. Oh, I knew I was. Okay. I didn't care. I was, I was too full of myself. I was, a, uh, I was Master Butthead. I was a Mr. Know-it-all. It's like the, the, the um, bumper stickers that you see. You know, I wish I was 16 again so I knew it all. <laughs> that, that was me at age 16, yes. 17. Uh, so eventually Bone had it. He just threw, he threw me out of the school for about nine months, and I got a real dose of real life. I started working at a shell station, and, and I missed karate terribly. And eventually he let me back in. And once he let me back in, I learned the air of my ways. I started reading books by Funakoshi and all these traditional masters. I really gained a high respect for kata. In fact, I started competing more in kata and won more trophies in kata than I actually did in sparring. So in a long roundabout way, uh, martial arts came easy to me because all my instructors took me on as personal training partners from the beginning, but I had to get my head on straight. And I had to go through that pain of being thrown out of the school in order to really appreciate the value of what I was doing. Wonderful, sort of a, you don't know what you have until you've lost it. Yeah, it's the best thing I ever had, moment. and I just, just threw it out the window. It's fantastic, and I think it gives us a pretty good context for your love of the martial arts and certainly a career that has been based in the martial arts, and we're going to get more into that later. But we're all about stories, as I've said. So I'd like you to share with us your best martial arts story. Some of your listeners may know the name Mike Anderson. Mike Anderson is a genius. He's the guy that created full contact karate. He created um, semi-contact karate because he was the first tournament to require safety gear in 1973 at the top 10 nationals. Then he created full contact karate with a 90-minute ABC sports special that was the highest rated special of the year. So this was a big deal. This was when Joe Lewis, Bill Wallace, Jeff Smith, and Isaiah Duenas from Mexico earned their world titles and became legends in the sport. Well, Mike Anderson was the guy behind all that. And what he used to drive his sport ambitions was his magazine, which was Professional Karate Magazine. I distinctly recall buying the first issue on my first night as a white belt. I still have that issue. It's the best magazine ever. So fast forward a couple decades, and he wants to replicate or, re, or, or kind of relaunch the professional karate magazine concept in a new magazine called Fighter Magazine. And this was full color, distributed in 140 countries. I was an editor of it. It was my first magazine job. So it was super cool. And then things started going kind of crazy, and Mike had to leave the country real fast to avoid going to jail. So he sold the magazine to a guy named Howard. I'm going to leave Howard's last name out. But Howard had moved to the Tampa Bay area from Atlantic City. He was in the witness protection program because he ratted out some of the Gambino gangsters up there. He was involved in uh, fight cards, drug smuggling, dealing, and also he had a city mag, Atlantic City City mag which is a good magazine to have because you get free tickets, you're connected to everybody. 
So he and his partner had this magazine, the City Mag. Then one night his partner emptied the bank account of twenty some thousand dollars and left and left him high and dry. And that's about the time that Howard got popped for drugs and and, and, and pleaded out and was in the witness protection program. It was in the days, oddly enough, it was a witness protection program, but you're allowed to keep your, your same name. It was weird. Anyway, so he's here. So Mike Anderson sells him Fighter Magazine. And we go to work on the next issue of Fighter Magazine under now Howard instead of Mike Anderson. And we did it in the old way. We did it where you'd actually cut paper out and paste it to a board, which you may refer to as cut and paste. We actually did that, laying this magazine out. It was incredibly tedious. And at the same time, I had my school and I was teaching at a um, racquetball club in St. Petersburg, Florida, high end racquetball club. And they loved me. They thought I was the cat's size because I was a, I had a TV show. I was in the magazines. I was on the radio and all that stuff. I was a local celebrity. So I was treated well there. So the owner kind of took me under his wing. The owner's name is Al. And Al showed me the Macintosh computer. And particularly this program that they use for their newsletters called PageMaker. And this allowed you to lay out a newsletter or a magazine in the computer and then just deliver the file. So you didn't have to physically do it anymore. So I went to Howard and I said, Howard, this is amazing. We've got to look at this. We can do this without having to do it physically. We can do it on the computer. There's this pro program called PageMaker and this thing called a Macintosh. He said, oh, yeah, okay. So I set up a meeting between Howard and Al, and we went to uh, Al's office. I walked in first, and then Howard walked in behind me. He stopped, stared at Al, and then I realized what the situation was. Al was his former partner who ripped him off for $20,000 overnight. <laughs> try, try mediating that conversation <laughs> hi howard this is al al this is howard so needless to say we got a couple of years worth of fighter magazines done for free but i always thought that that is one of those you know you can run but you can't hide stories there's all there's, there's karma there's some absolute karma yeah, but, going on in there and you said it was difficult to mediate. Did it stay at words? I yeah, they didn't. They didn't start to throw it down. It was, I, I wasn't oh. going to let that happen. Uh, but it, it was just it was worked out amicably in the degree. Uh, Al's situation was he had a daughter who was very ill and he needed money for um, medical expenses. I'm still in touch with Al to this day. He is a good guy. Uh, and Howard has gone on and, and done his thing. But what they just worked out a long term trade for the production of the magazine. So in a sense, uh, Howard got his money back with interest in just an indirect way. So in the end, it worked out okay. It's a good ending to quite the the intense drama at the beginning. Yeah, was, no kidding. I was wondering where the, how that one was going to play out. That's a heavy story. Whoa, whoa. It's certainly a great one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are the odds of that? Yeah. Yeah. It's. I was expecting um, – probably the, the strangest plot as you were describing this meeting, the strangest plot for a fight scene ever. Yeah. You know, it's usually, you know, you wronged my family or, uh, yeah, you could sum up every martial arts movie in three lines. You know, you, you, you did something wrong. I've consulted with my grandmaster. Now you must die. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's really, you have offended my family. You've offended my doge. You've offended something. You did something. I've consulted with grandmaster. Now you must die. And this was you must you must die or print some magazines for me. <laughs> yeah. And fortunately, we went the non filing yeah, route. Yeah, that was it. It was pretty cool. I mean, this, some of these guys were were serious players. I mean, they they were involved in they were involved in hit jobs and murders and all that kind of stuff. Doesn't every dojo have that? Uh, no, no. But you're not the first to talk about a bit of that on the show. Um, Victor Moore has shared some intense stories I, with I us. I bet he so. does. Yeah, that's how interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I saw him at Joe Lewis's funeral. That's the first time I met the guy. Oh wow! Yeah, he's a he's a great guy and and uh, loves sharing his past. Now you've been involved in the martial arts pretty continuously, other than that that short break, I expect. So it's had a big impact on who you are as a person. Would you say that's a fair fair statement? I hope not. No. Yeah, I hope not. Okay. Well, then I'm going to ask you to run with that because that, that might bring us in a different direction than the question I was going to ask. How has the martial arts not 
changed you, you hope? There were a lot of things that I discovered goal setting and the principles of success that I formulated in my life through Brian Tracy, not through Walt Bone or any of my karate instructors. These guys were not examples to follow in any area other than karate. They're martial arts. They were, they were good guys. They were honest. They were honorable. They wouldn't rip you off. In fact, they'd give you the shirt over, off their back. And to that degree, it was, it was a helpful process. But I learned far more outside the martial arts than I have inside the martial arts. I'm, I'm, I'm a voracious reader, studier, and I, I never there – was, there was a point when I was a brown belt. There were some things that happened that made it very clear to me these are not necessarily the role models I really want in my life. And I kept that filter, and I still have that filter. Interesting. Well, you've answered that in a very different way than anyone else has. So it makes me wonder, have you had instructors that fit more of the idealistic model that many of us look to, the the role model that it sounds like you really didn't have There's, with your early instructors? Well, I, I want to be clear. When it came to fitness, honesty, sharing your knowledge, honoring the arts by proper execution, demonstrating respect, they were all great role models in those regards, in, in those particular, if you would say, categories of life skills. Um, when it came to judgment, morality, that kind of guidance was not existent. There was a different set of rules that I slowly learned, way too slowly, learned that was not the path that I wanted to follow. So I'm always suspicious of – let me just rewind the tape for just a second. We have to understand that the martial arts is an unlicensed un, – there's no educational prerequisite to become a martial arts school owner. You don't even need a black belt. In fact, there's no real requirement for black belt, and I think that's good. I don't, I'm not a, a regulations fan by any stretch. However, you can come out of college with an MBA and open a school, and you can come out of prison and open a school as well. And often, or maybe, that former prisoner carries a lot of baggage with him, but he's very charismatic, and he can get kids, teenagers, other people to follow him. And in their mind, they're learning under this, this master instructor. And it, create, it can create a very dangerous loop. There's a lot of Kool-Aid being dispensed in the martial arts. There's a tremendous amount of um, – it's, it's a regurgitation of sickness mm. because people that are deeply involved in the martial arts – to the degree like I was and to the degree my instructors are, there are some common denominators in there. And I've spent a lot of time uh, with psychologists and, and, and counselors that have that, that I've brought in specifically for interviews related to this. And, and that um, there's some – there are just some things going on that make – that should make people more suspicious of who they're training with. And what is being taught? If somebody becomes a martial arts, martial arts as a career like I have, or guys particularly, and this, and this is particularly people who got their black belts up until probably 2000 or so, because I, I really don't know as much from that point. But these are people that in most cases in their childhood had a lot of intimidation. They were either getting physically abused, mentally abused, sexually abused, any or all of the above. And it, it, according to psychologists, that gives them a, a sense of powerlessness and a feeling of intimidation and lack of control. You have no control of your life because you're just a kid and all this stuff is going on around you. I've had this conversation with virtually all major martial artists from Joe Lewis and Bill Wallace down. And it's, it, it, it's, the answer I get is, holy cow, you're talking about me. 
So it, there is this period along there's this period of during very formative years where there's this abuse is going on. Then you join a martial arts school. And in that school, you have a direct path to getting respect and control. If you train hard, you advance in rank. As you advance in rank, people start to respect you. This may be the first time in your life anybody's respected you. And before you know it, they're calling you Mr. Graydon or Master Graydon or Sheehan Graydon. So now these titles start to become like light to a moth or water to a plant. It gives them a new life. They have a new identity. And that can lead to a very dysfunctional um, interaction with students and the whole school scenario. For someone that has been intimidated for a long period of time, bullied a long period of time, out of control for a long period of time, once they get control of a karate class, they're in heaven. They're controlling everything. Everything is turned around. They're going to tell you how to position your pinky, how to breathe, where to look, when to think, what to think. And everything about that class is being controlled in that beginning of the class. At the end of the class, they're all going to bow to me. That kind of situation can create some really messed up personalities and psyches. So that's that's kind of my uh, pro probably too long-winded insights into dealing with martial artists, the full range of uh, over the course of, say, 40 years. We'll just sum it up there. Sure. And that's some pretty profound stuff. And, and I found myself listening. And, and I'll be honest, there was a little bit of an emotional response there for me, but I can't find disagreement with anything that you said. You certainly profiled me as well. You know, I grew up a smaller individual who was bullied, and the only thing that ever kept it from going physical was that everyone knew I trained in karate. Mm -hmm. So do you have any advice for people? Because, yeah, quite often we're telling people, get your kids into the martial arts. Look for a school that they're going to respond to, that they're going to learn good things at. But you're adding another level, it sounds like, of determination to figure out, is this an appropriate school to train at? You know, I, I am speaking as though I'm speaking to peers and I'm not necessarily speaking to mom and dad who's picking a school. But if mom and dad out there are listening and thinking about a school, understand that choosing a school is choosing a style and it's not a martial arts style. It is the teaching style of the person in charge. Watch that person very closely. Go visit many classes. Watch the advanced students. A, you want to see that they're in shape. B, watch how they carry themselves. Are they rude or are they polite? Are they in shape or are they out of shape? Does it look like they've really learned some skills? You know, I don't care so much about the content. I, I really do, frankly. But I think the decision to join the school starts with the leadership. So the first style to evaluate is the teaching style of the instructor. And after that, you know, you can get into curriculum and all that kind of fun stuff. But I, I you know, I find it very interesting to me. And it's, it's telling, it is very telling that here we are in 2015. And probably the, no doubt the most influential martial artists in American history and in, in probably all history Bruce Lee wrote in his article, The Classical Mess, or whatever he called it, in 1971 in Black Belt, talked about the futility of style and that to label a style is to limit a style. And that, you know, to discard what is useless and use what is useful, and that's certainly going to be a uh, matter of perspective in terms of useful and what's useless. But at this late stage, with all this information and education that's gone by for decades and right now i would hope though i don't see it but i would hope that we are the most educated martial artists in history that there's a there's still a tremendous emphasis on style we do taekwondo we do kempo we do shotokan we do gojiru and i just i, I it baffles my mind 
how and why someone would perpetuate and in fact build their future around a style rather than focusing on just the results of the style. Does that make any sense to you? What I mean, what I mean by that is I want my students to be in good shape. I want them to honor the arts by having excellent execution on their punches, kicks, and techniques. I want them to be respectful. I want them to have a positive, uh, resilient outlook on life. So if I can get those res results, I want to get them as fast as I can regardless of the style. And what I see in working with martial arts schools worldwide and have for decades is that the style is the biggest impediment to getting to those results. It's as though the school advertises locally. Well, you just use an analogy. We say, okay, we will teach you English. And people that don't speak English say, wow, that's great. I want to learn English. I need to learn English. English would really improve my life. In fact, I, I know I could protect myself and have a safer life in America if I could speak English, take care of my family better. So now I sign up because this school is going to teach me English. And then the school starts to teach you Latin. You say, well, wait a second. Now, you promised to teach me English. You said it was easy and fun, and now you're teaching me Latin. And the response is, well, you've got to do Latin first for a while before you can really appreciate English. That's the experience in most martial arts schools today. They get promised self-defense. They get promised fitness. They get promised that this stuff is easy to learn. It's fun. And they get started in on the tedium of front stance, back stance, horse stance, punching, and and all this held over technical, traditional material that has its place and has its value, but I don't think that value is part of a new student's experience. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Well, I'd like to put push you a little bit on it because I think it's a really interesting I subject. I don't want to get long winded on you. I'm already putting people to sleep. I'm sure I'm good for some. No, no, this. No, we, we have a pretty academic audience. People like getting into the weeds on this stuff. And even if they don't, I do. So I want to hear a little bit more. So are you advocating overall against traditionalism? Not at all. I don't okay. think – here. here's the reality, and this is where I like to live. It, it puts me at odds with the vast majority of martial artists I deal with. The traditional experience is contrary to what – most beginners want, need, or benefit from. Less than one half of one half of one half percent of schools, or students rather say, join a school, A, because of the style, or B, because they want to learn forms and traditional techniques. They don't, that's not why they joined the school, but that's what we give them. They join to learn English, but we teach them Latin. Mm -hmm. And what happens? It's not attractive. It's not interesting. It's boring. It's hard. And there's a huge dropout. Uh, uh, retention becomes a real difficult. Of course, it's difficult. It's like you're teaching Russian ballet to someone who wants to learn hip hop. It's exactly like that. So I think that if you are a traditional martial arts instructor, bully for you, that's great. You have a great skill. And if you can take somebody to black belt in that particular style, that's fantastic. But understand that the majority of people who are inquiring about martial arts at your school don't have that interest. There is a percentage that will, and I'm not saying don't teach it because I, if you wanted to learn to get a black belt in Taekwondo from me, which is the only traditional style I'm qualified to teach is Taekwondo, it's the only one I know. So if you want to learn a black belt from me in Taekwondo, that's going to be the most expensive course I teach. It's the most difficult to teach. It requires the highest and most rare qualifications in an instructor. So you, you contrast that to a more kickboxing or eclectic style where you don't need to have that level of complexity or qualification for the instructor, nor do you have as much interest. There's less interest in the traditional material, and there's a lot more interest on the more eclectic side, the using what works mindset. This is very similar to what we've designed as Empower Kickboxing. 
in power kickboxing is a program designed exactly as I'm describing, but it mixes kickboxing, martial arts, ground, and weapons all into one curriculum. Every class is interesting. Every class is challenging. But you can get a brand new student up and running in three minutes, and they're part of the class, and they'll be fine for the whole class. And you can have all ranks in one class. It doesn't make a difference. The, the, the students can advance and get their black belt, but you don't have to have separate classes. You don't need to have complex uh, curriculum that people are going to forget a year after they stop training. It's, it's highly doable. What I'm describing is it can be done. It just flies in the face of the Kool-Aid that's been dispensed for the last four decades. Interesting. So for those martial artists that have a school that are teaching traditional martial arts in a traditional way with the, the Kool-Aid method, as you're calling it, would you advocate starting students in a more self-defense fitness environment and gradually bringing them up into the more traditional yes elements yeah that okay. would be a good way to do it and and, and i want to make a couple of points one martial arts and self-defense are like um oil and what no that's, that's not a good they don't martial arts has nothing to do with self-defense most schools are engaged in false advertising when they advertise self-defense so just it, i i'm first to admit i I owe people thousands upon thousands of dollars in refunds for <laughs> what I call the self-defense. That was I mean, you don't know you don't know what you don't know. It's just ignorance. But I was told this is self-defense and and I and I retaught it for years and it, and it was just stupid. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you a, a moment that I remember where this uh, really came to me. I was running, I created the first professional association for the martial arts school business. It was called NAPMA in 2003. No, 1997, I'm sorry. So I was in uh, Dallas, Texas, getting ready for a seminar I was teaching the next day to a bunch of schools. And I was on a Stairmaster in the gym, and the basketball court was in the center. And in the basketball court, a guy came out and started a karate class. There was about eight adult students, green belts, in the class. And he was teaching a form that I knew well. This was in Texas. He was a Texquando guy. He was probably in the same school chain as I was because he was doing the same form. And they did this move where you spin around and you do a square block. We called it a rectangular block. You've got one hand that's doing the kind of rising block or high block. Then you've got the one other arm that's going out from the shoulder doing kind of a side block. So he explained to the students, with this block, you're blocking two attacks at the same time. You're getting the guy who's attacking your head with this high block. And then from the side, you're blocking this kick that's coming around your head like a round kick with this block. So you're getting both at the same time. And I watched all those students nod their head in understanding. And I thought to myself, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> How on earth can you say that with a straight face? And I thought, I've been saying that exact same explanation for 30 years. It's just dumb. It's Kool-Aid. That's Kool-Aid. <laughs> so going back to your question, you advocate starting – I advocate starting students in a program that's easy to learn, fun, and, and really gets them connected to your school. A traditional program is going to have a hard time doing that. Now, mind you, there are very charismatic, excellent traditional instructors out there who've got packed classes and people on waiting lists. That is far more the exception than the rule. And I'm, and, and I'm not advocating – an L.A. boxing or uh, fitness kickboxing. That's not what I'm describing here either. I'm describing real martial arts. Again, going back to the benefits. I want my students to be able to write the check if they need to. They must learn to defend themselves. They have to be in good shape. They have to have excellent quality in their techniques because we honor the arts by doing them well. And I want that positive attitude. And they want to be, I want them to be respectful. So it's four or five serious results that I'm trying to get. And I'm not saying you're going to get those through a fitness kickboxing program. What I'm describing with Empower Kickboxing is a martial arts, it's a martial arts program. Every month, the focus of the curriculum changes. So one month, it might be Muay Thai. The next month, it's going to be the open hand techniques of Karate Do. The following month, it's going to be escaping the mount. The following month, it's going to be the Nunchakus. But because you, you, if you understand 
the classroom structure, all real teaching happens in about seven to 10 minutes in terms of technical breakdown in teaching, at least in a good class. In many classes, the workout is in seven to 10 minutes, and the rest of the time is spent following the instructor doing a form step by step, which is about as fun as watching grass grow. So it's, um, it's, it's backwards. So again, there are plenty of guys that are doing a good job with their traditional programs. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't suggest them changing anything, but when schools come to me, they say, I'm struggling. I've been open for five years and you know, I've got 15 students. First thing I ask them, what are you teaching? Traditional fill in the blank. And that, that, that's where the problem lies initially. And that's fantastic advice. And obviously, we're going to get a little bit more into what you do and what you offer as we get towards the end of the episode. But for well, the people think, that are hanging in here to the end, <laughs> I was really I'm sure everybody's listening. No, this is, this, for is punishment. Stuff. <laughs> this is great stuff. And I feel like I've just learned a lot listening to you over the last few minutes as you were talking about that. You know, I did have a school for a couple of years and I absolutely am able to remember specific instances where what you are talking about, what you're suggesting would have worked better with some individuals. So that, that, thank you for sharing you that think about you know, 80% of students now are kids. Traditional forms weren't meant to be taught to kids. They were meant to be taught that they were developed by highly disciplined adults to be taught to other highly disciplined adults, mostly in kind of a military atmosphere. They weren't designed for eight-year-olds with ADHD. It's just torture. I mean, why do that to yourself? It's true. And I have to say, and this is one that really will <laughs> – this is a good line. It's, a, it's the truth, though. I feel like you're, you're getting ready to poke the bear again. <laughs> um, actually, it's a line that I heard from Woody Allen. He's my all-time favorite directors and comedians. And he was talking about self-defense, taking self-defense. And he, he, he had a, a – a couple lines, and one was that you know, once I started taking the classes, it was really hard. I figured I'd just take the tuition, pay the instructor to follow me around. <laughs> I thought that, I thought that was a good line. But what he said was, and this is Woody Allen thinking, we won the war. Why are we going to Japan to learn how to fight? We won. I thought, holy cow, he's right. That's really interesting. That's just perspective. You see, I, I listen to all perspectives, and that was one that struck me. That that's absolutely fascinating and a big poke of the bear. Ooh, yeah, that's a that's a big bear bear poke right right now. And uh, that's what we're gonna have to make sure your contact information's in here on the show notes. So I'm not getting all the the hate mail. No, I'm just kidding. I don't I, mind. You're 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 ra- you're raising good points. I mean, and even though I'm sure that there are going to be plenty of people that listen that disagree with some or or all of what you're saying, yeah. your logic is good. There's, there's abs. Well, disagreement doesn't always have to be rational. Nope, doesn't. No, it's just my observations and, and, and from but, my perspective and what my goals are. It's different for everybody. But they're sound. And what I'm enjoying about talking to you is that you've given me a lot to go think about, and that's a lot of fun. I, I like thinking about the martial arts. So let's pull back. Let's let's go back to some more martial arts fun stuff, fun questions and and, and aspects to who you are. So I'm. I know you've trained with quite a few people. You've already dropped a few names and mentioned Joe Lewis and that you know Bill Wallace and everything. Who would you say the most influential on your martial arts career has been? For different reasons. Walt Bone for dedication to the arts, sharing your knowledge. You know, he 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 taught in a really different way. He was he was raised, and I think I think his influence actually was Tom Landry, the coach of the Dallas Cowboys, because he was a huge Cowboys fan in the 70s, was negative reinforcement. You never give a student a compliment. And I look at schools today. I was in a school recently watching an exam, and this is a top-notch black belt who had really good students. But every time the kids did anything, he said, good job. And one kid, in fact, was trying to skip sidekick three boards. And he never did it. And on the final try, he bounced off the boards. And he got a good job and a high five. And that is, I think, really dangerous. And it's happening throughout our society right now. And that's, a, that's an offshoot of the self-esteem movement back in the 1970s. Oddly enough, the purveyor, the pioneer in the self-esteem movement in the 70s was a 
Los Angeles-based psychologist named Dr. Nathaniel Brandon. One of his protégés was this guy named Joe Lewis. Mm. And Joe Lewis was the second person who really influenced my martial arts. He had a completely pragmatic approach to training. He had no baggage. Now, mind you, he was raised in a very strict Okinawan karate karate uh, school. He he got his uh, black belt in three months. The instructor tried to show off on him, so he picked him up and threw him across the dojo and walked out. He went across <sighs> town and joined another school. He failed his green belt test there, but he came back and he made his black belt in seven months. When he came to the States, he entered his first tournament reluctantly. He showed up to watch the Nationals in D.C. June Rhee convinced him to compete. He won fighting, had one point scored with him on him the entire day. He won kata, and he won weapons. And then he went back the following year and did the same thing, won all three. That's like a rookie stepping in and winning the Masters and then coming back and doing it again. Yeah. But shortly after that time, he completely discounted kata as a waste of time, and he never spent any more time or thought on it. So, and I'll give you another example. Lewis was always evolving. We trained. He moved. He moved back here in 1984. Took me on as his personal training partner for about a little over a decade. Uh, and shortly after I started working with him, my brother, my brother Jim did as well. So we we'd go into a local boxing club with a 12 by 12 ring in the center and, and just basically kill each other. It was, it was loads of fun, but he was always teaching. Uh, and so then, you know, fast forward a decade and I get together with him and work out and I'm hitting the bag. And he says, uh, he's correcting my right cross, which I used to call reverse punch in my Taekwondo days. And he, he basically told me the exact opposite of what he told me 10 or 12 years earlier. And I said, Joe, that's the exact opposite of what you told me, you know, at, at this particular time when we were training. He goes, what, you don't think I should evolve? And it was a really simple answer. What, you don't think I should evolve? But I wonder how many instructors have that as an answer. Have they evolved? Have they evolved? So my, my answer as to who was influential was uh, Walt Bone for Dedication to the Arts and Joe Lewis for a completely pragmatic, critical thinking approach. If I'm going to pose a question that, that was not in the list that I sent you, and I'm hoping that that's okay. If Mr. Lewis was to listen to our discussion earlier about teaching martial arts, do you think he'd agree with all of it or part of it? Completely. Completely. We had this conversation a thousand times. Oh, okay. And he, you know, he was raised. He was the youngest of three brothers. They were bad dudes. They were really rough. You did not cut across the lowest young lawn in Wilmington, North Carolina. He's raised on a farm. His brothers, one murdered some guy, and they both spent time in prison. So when Joe went to you know grade school or middle school or high school, the teachers all thought he was going to be just like them. So he was immediately condemned. And so he, so he was raised in a hyper violent intimidating atmosphere his parents would beat him if he didn't read something right and then once he got it right they'd beat him again for not doing it right the first time mm. so i mean i've, I've had again <laughs> there's not a there, there's not a career serious this is what i'm doing for my life martial artists i've had this conversation with that did not say holy cow you just described me right it's intense it is it's interesting i find it fascinating i love this stuff Good. Me too. And that, that's why you're on the show. <laughs> that's kind of convenient. So if you could train with someone that you haven't, living or dead, we'll, we'll open it that wide, who would that be? Jesus Christ or Paul. Okay. That, that's, we're, we're, we're getting out of the realm of where we usually go. Tell us more. What better teacher? There is no better teacher. There, you know, we, our time today was set at 1030. Why was it set at 1030? What is our time based upon? The birth of Jesus Christ. I mean, who, who's had more influence than that? I mean, I just, as, as I get older, I just get blown away. I mean, all these, these guys running around call themselves masters. Oh, let's see you walk on water, pal. You know, I don't, that's why I don't, I don't buy into the master thing. I never have. Even when I was a young brown belt, I just, I'd watch these guys and they would make you do push-ups if you didn't call them master. And 
uh, Jesus Christ, nobody has had more influence. What better teacher is there? And then Paul. I just learned about Paul in the last five years, and he, he had, you know, he was the the, the biggest uh, anti Jesus leader. He was he participated in the stoning of Stephen. He was persecuting the early Christians. Oddly enough, they weren't called Christians. They were followers of the way is what they called it. Isn't that interesting? Martial artists use that word as well, the mm. way. Yeah. And I discovered that's what, that's what initially, before Christians were called Christians, they were followers of the way. And it was the way of Jesus Christ. And then Paul had, was blinded in a vision where he was visited by Jesus. And he, he went from being the most critical, aggressive, violent antagonists of all of people following the way to their biggest champion. And he wrote the vast majority of the New Testament. I mean, all this stuff is mind blowing. So anybody out there listening who's tried to read the Bible like I have and gone to sleep real fast, like I have, uh, skip the Old Testament, go right to the New Testament and get one of the easier to read versions. It is a fascinating read. And again, most of it is from the guy who was the biggest anti-Jesus guy on the planet until he had his vision. It's fascinating, fascinating. Interesting. How do you, how does your tie to, I mean, should I say Christianity? Sure. I mean, is, is there a religious influence in the way you approach martial arts? I would like to think that as I get older and hopefully wiser, that I am balancing my decisions that so that they walk with Jesus. It is incredible incredibly hard to do. It is enormously difficult. It's particularly living in a society that is now in many ways following, chasing, worshiping Kanye West and in, in, in false gods. And I see the same thing in the martial arts. Like, you know, these, these, these are just guys. They're just guys like you're you're just a guy. You know, this guy started karate before you did. Doesn't mean he is he walks on water. He doesn't walk on water. He's just a guy. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I do my best to do that, and I fail miserably most of the time. But it, it's a quest. There's a lot of parallels there. Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. I'm, I'm really enjoying. Uh, you're, you're blowing my mind, and people that listen to the show might hear that I'm stumbling a little bit more than I normally do in asking my questions because I'm trying to shut off the half of my brain that's really trying to process what you're saying to me. So I appreciate that. It's nice. It's recorded then. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to go back and listen Tonight, to it a couple you times. have a hard time sleeping, plug me in and you'll go right. <laughs> no, it, this would keep me up <laughs> without a doubt. So let's get into some lighter questions. Some, some really fun ones. Movies. Are you a movie guy at all? I am a huge student of film. Oh, wonderful. So how about some martial arts movies that you enjoy? <laughs> Um, Raging Bull. Okay, that would be the closest thing. Um, I mean, I saw Into I saw Into the Dragon as a kid fifty some times. I loved it. I could quote every like all of us. We I could quote every every. But I saw it recently with my wife in a theater, and it just didn't hold up at all. Bruce Lee couldn't act to save his life, and it was just it was just, it was terrible. I was actually thinking I'm sitting there watching the movie and thinking, all right, we've got the they're going to kill Kelly. Then there's going to be the courtyard fight, and then the fight against um, uh, Han, and and the mirrors, and then we'll be out of here. And I was I was counting down till it ended. I've I've never seen a martial arts film other than that's than Enter the Dragon when I was a kid, that I thought was really anything other than um, grade Z entertainment. But Raging Bull, Martin Scorsese can't beat it. Can't beat it, Martin Scorsese. Okay. Or Excalibur. Here's, here's a good example. Excalibur, 1982. John Borman was the director. Beautifully shot film. Great story of King Arthur and the round table. Completely overacted. I mean, they, these guys really went over the top in their lines and all. And it's overacted as it was. It's a gazillion times better than any martial arts film I've ever seen. It's fair. It's absolutely fair. And then you're right. The vast majority of martial arts films, and I think even even those of us that are fans agree, the acting's terrible. It, and for some of us, that makes it fun. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's it's, it's action is the main attraction. Sure. 
Now, you've written a number of books, and I'd like you to tell us about a couple of them, and hopefully you can tell us about one that's not from your catalog that you enjoy. Well, in terms – the first book that I wrote was Black Belt Management, How to Achieve Success Without Selling Out in 1993. I'd opened my school. I struggled with my school. I had no idea how to run the business, and it almost went under. But then I started studying school owners that produce excellent black belts because that would always be, always be priority one to me, but had a six-figure income from the school personally in doing so. So I studied these guys, and I discovered there were consistent – key elements that were always in place. And I applied those elements to my school and it worked. And I was one of those six figure school owners within about 18 months of doing that. So I knew that there was a lot of guys out there like me who were running a dojo, a dungeon dojos as I call them. So I wrote the book in hoping it would connect with people. It connected big time. They knew me as a fighter again, because I, I was in the magazines and, and, and pretty popular getting some acclaim in that regard. So they knew that if Graydon could do it, I could, because he's, he's a good black belt. He's not going to, he's not going to sell out. And that was the big angle. So I started doing seminars, teaching these principles and at a seminar in Las Vegas, the host of the seminar, the guy who runs a billing company called the independent funding company, Larry Doak walked up on stage in front of about 300 school owners. They handed me a box of business cards. And it said, John Graydon, President, National Association of Professional Martial Artists. He said, John, you're the only guy that can do this. And that was – and then the, the, the crowd went crazy. It was one of those moments. <laughs> <laughs> so it was uh, – that was the launch or at least the encouragement and support that helped me launch the uh, National Association of Professional Martial Artists and NATMA, which eventually got too powerful because when I started advocating that – the reason so many adults stay away from martial arts, one of those big reasons is that because we have the world's ugliest fitness outfit. And, <laughs> and that was in reference to the karate gi. And Century Martial Arts didn't like that. So they started the attack. And over the course of the next five or six years, they sued the company away from me. And I lost it in 2003. And then I started the Martial Arts Teachers Association, which is basically an online version, which uh, I think is a whole lot better. So that dysfunction in the martial arts works at all levels, let me assure you. The next best book I would recommend for your readers or, or your, your guys, especially if they're involved in the running of a school, is The Truth About the Martial Arts Business from 2006. That was um, a big seller. And right now I'm working on a book called Who Killed Walt Bone? And it is the story, it's a coming-of-age story that is kind of the karate kid meets dazed and confused, if you're familiar with those films. <laughs> yeah. That was my upbringing in the arts, and I've alluded to some of those stories today. I started at age 14, and I um, trained very hard. My instructor died in 1979 in a plane crash while smuggling drugs. And it was a shock to me, and all that stuff's in the book, but it's a, it's a fascinating book, and it certainly is a different experience than most uh, people's experience, I imagine, coming up in a martial arts school. Definitely different. Wow. CIA killers and drug smugglers and all the kind, well, of, this... all the kind of fun stuff that <laughs> makes it an interesting book. Yeah. Will that be your first non-instructional book? Yes, it is what I think is going to be the first of a trilogy. Uh, we're going to – this is – up until my instructor died in 1982, December 16th, 1982, then the next segment would be my school – when I was running the schools, competing on the U.S. teams around the world, training with Joe Lewis, and the third book would be launching NATMA, uh, the lawsuits from Century – and the um, interesting insights and revelations that came out of those documents and experiences. So I'm 55 in a couple of months, and I think this is a time to start telling my story. It's a pretty good one. I think it will help a lot of people, or at least will entertain them. Absolutely. And if your writing is anything like you're speaking, they'll, they'll be wonderfully entertaining, and I'm certainly going to read them. Thanks. So please keep, keep me in the loop so I can keep the listeners in the loop. Yeah, please do. As to where you are with those books. Do you have any goals? Tons. 
Tell us about some of them. I am a speaker. That's what I like to do. I'm a te- I'm, let me rephrase that. I'm a teacher by nature, and I use various mediums to teach, and that's writing. Obviously, we're doing a, a podcast here, but I'm best in front of thousands or hundreds of people, so that's what I'm starting to work on now. And one of the things that came out of the century thing was that there was, at least for a little while, a um, – Persona non grata became damaged goods in such a way. Uh, my my value to people was diminished because I no longer had an atma. And that's been changing, and, and it's been a beautiful thing where people are um, re-embracing the way that I teach and what I teach, and it's really turning full circle. So I look forward to getting in front of students, instructors, school owners, and oddly enough, the other area that I'm doing a lot of presentations is in training attorneys, training attorneys on how to present, how to speak, how to market. That's been a trip. And there's a, a tremendous amount of similarities between the legal field and the martial arts field. They're both they're both very traditional. There is all kinds of stigmas about selling out. It's a lot of what I've experienced for years in the martial arts, but just with the uh, <laughs> much higher invoices. <laughs> <laughs> cool. It is, yeah. It is really cool. That's really interesting. How about with your training? Are you doing, you doing much training yeah. at this time? Sounds like you're pretty busy. Train two, three times a week. At least I, I, I run, lift weights. I don't have a local school. I'd like to. I miss sparring. I haven't sparred in a few years. I, I've done some work with Chris Sutton from Cobra Defense. I highly recommend you make him one of your interviews. He's uh, the best self. Def- he is the best self defense instructor I've ever seen. His material is the best, and I have seen. I have to say that I've seen them all, but I'm the one that brought Krav Maga into the martial arts industry. I did that at one of my conventions when I had Natma. There were two thousand oh, cool. two thousand school owners there, and I knew by that time that most schools have no business advertising self defense, and I wanted to bring in the best self-defense guys I could find to really help bridge that gap. So I brought in uh, Krav Maga, Bill Kipp from Fast Defense, Peyton Quinn from RimCap, uh, John Pellegrini from Combat Hapkido, uh, and a guy from CDT, I forget his name, Tom somebody, Tom Petiri from CDT. I brought these guys, gave them the stage, and really made them lots of money and got them lots of exposure. But Ten years after all of that, I'm watching a class here in Clearwater, Florida, and the instructor walks out and does a segment on anti-abduction. I turn to my wife and said, I couldn't have taught a minute of that. That's the best I've ever seen. And that was Chris Sutton, who was, who's was who got this fantastic program called the Cobra Defense System. So to all you instructors out there, check it out. If you're not an instructor, check it out just to learn the principles of the self-defense. It's all law enforcement based. It's not martial arts based. Interesting. Yeah. If you could make an introduction, I'd love to talk to him. We'll do that. Fantastic. You know, it's an interesting side story. Yeah. Uh, Chris, like all guys, he, he falls in the same category I described earlier. When he was 10 years old, 11 years old, his dad came home after hitting the bars and started uh, beating or, or beating up on his, um, his brother. And Chris had been watching my TV show, and I had a show called USA Karate for 10 years. And one of the things I said on the show is you have to do something, if nothing else, pick up something and hit him with it. So he picked up a book, and he hit his dad in the head and knocked him out cold. (laughs) 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 He he credits me as his first karate instructor on TV. That's super cool. (laughs) That's so much fun. It is. So now's your chance – not that we haven't gotten to know a lot about you and what you offer, but tell us a bit more. If people want to see you speak or become part of uh, MATA, am I getting the acronym right? Mata like Kata. Mata. Okay, Mata. That's interesting. I called Mike Anderson. It was the first guy I called. He speaks seven languages. The guy's super intelligent. And I said, hey, I've got this idea. It's a martial arts teachers association. The, sh- the acronym is Mata. He goes, that's a really good idea except one problem. I said, what's that? Mata means to kill in about every version of Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, well, some martial arts are like that. So anyway, my website is martialartsteachers.com, just like it sounds. 
And my, if you want to follow my books, my writing, my coaching, that kind of stuff, if you're writing a book and you'd like some help with it, johngraden.com is my site. And my email address is real simple. It's john at johngraden.com. Or senior master grand poobah graden at forgetthis.com. <laughs> I'm expecting if someone sends something to that, it's actually not going to resolve. It's going to bounce back at you. But... Who can, resist? Yeah. Who can resist? Absolutely. So much fun. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And I'm hoping you have some closing words of wisdom for all of us. For me? Wisdom? From <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't have any idea. Watch out for Kool-Aid dispensers. I think that's really big. If you're training right now, you know, really evaluate the amount of time you're spending on things that in five years you may not ever do against you. I right now have no urge to do another kata in my life, even though I really embrace it. But I'd sure like to go hit a heavy bag or somebody in the head. <laughs> so, but, but I'm not longing to go out and do kata. So I don't want to do any more Russian ballet. Fair enough. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Jeremy, and good luck with your oh. podcast. Thanks for listening to episode 36 of Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Mr. Graydon. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes, including links to Mr. Graydon's websites, books, and a lot more. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our exclusive newsletter. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if we could trouble you to help us out briefly, please leave us a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts. If we read your review on the air, just contact us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlecake stuff. And don't forget to spread the word about our show to anyone that you think might like it. Remember the great stuff we make at Whistlekick, like our comfortable, lightweight sparring boots, available at whistlekick.com. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.